All right, so I'm gonna talk here about chapter twos. First, I'm gonna talk about the basic vocabulary and the concepts you need to know out of chapter two. Uh, the first main idea in chapter two that you need to understand is the definition of a graph. So chapter two, they go through a whole bunch of graphs and they're putting nodes and they're putting edges between them and what you need to make sure you understand is the graph itself. So whatever graph you're seeing is a representation of this network. And the network definition is defined by whoever created the graph. So everything you see there is something that the author, whoever chose to put there. So in this context here, I mean the context of that graph, you need to think here about the nodes in that graph being uh, some sort of object and usually that object needs to have some sort of agency, meaning they have sort of a will or an ability to act in the network and choosing to activate these edges and the edges being the connections between the nodes. There's lots of different ways to define the nodes and lots of different ways to define the connections. So again, the definition here is up to the researcher or whoever produced the graph. When you talk about connectivity from chapter two, the idea that's most important in this sense is this path idea. And if we're going to say, you know, we're following a path between two nodes in my graph, you know, this path is the sequence of nodes that are connected. The connection or the connectivity of the graph <clears throat> has something to do with the way the whole graph works together. So if we're gonna say a connected graph, meaning the researcher drew a graph here and every item or every node is linked, that means your graph you're showing is connected. We'll talk in a minute about a disconnected graph and why you would graph that. So we had the different ways of sort of measuring distances and a few other things. So the first idea was this breadth first search. And you can see here, you know, I've kind of put it in the slide, but the breadth first search is where you pick a node in the graph and you measure a distance from that node to every other node. It's gotta be the shortest path here. So a distance is always the shortest path. We aren't taking, you know, sort of, there's no long scenic route between two nodes. There's the shortest path, and that's what the breadth first search needs to find for us. Once we've done a breadth, breadth first search for every node, every pair of nodes in our graph, we then can figure out or and then we can determine what the diameter of the graph is. So the diameter of the graph is gonna be the longest distance between any pair of nodes in the graph. And then the average distance would be if we averaged every distance between every pair of nodes in a graph, that would be the average distance. Hopefully you're already thinking right now, if we see these really large graphs with thousands and thousands of nodes, you actually would not ever do even a breadth first search and determine any, you know, every distance in the graph. It's just too much computation. We'll talk about that issue in a little bit, or yeah, so you just wouldn't do it. All right, speaking of nodes. So nodes do have characteristics, and that was actually the main focus in this chapter. So we had uh, some terms here. Uh, the ones you need to be clear on, and I think these are clear in the exercises, the main point here is a pivotal node. That is, you have a pivotal node if we have a path between two pairs of nodes. A pivotal node falls on that path, and if you take that pivotal node out or remove an edge to the pivotal node, that would increase the distance between those two nodes. A gatekeeper is basically a type of pivotal node that is so pivotal that if you take it out, you have no possible way of connecting those two nodes again. So a gatekeeper is basically the extreme type of pivotal node. And that, you know, again, would make it so you can't connect two nodes, or there's some nodes that wouldn't be connected. And in that case, going back a couple here, we're talking about a graph that's no longer connected. If you, and again, 
It's not necessarily removing the gatekeeper, it's removing one of the edges between a gatekeeper and other nodes. A local gatekeeper is uh, sort of the junior version of a pivotal node. A local gatekeeper does connect to its neighbors. Its neighbors don't connect directly with each other. But in the case of a local gatekeeper, it's possible that they're not a pivotal node. That is, if you take out an edge to a local gatekeeper, you can still reach the other node and the distance could be the same length. Okay, so it's possible to be a local gatekeeper and not a pivotal node. Now, so that's basically what, you know, that's in the chapter and that's stuff that exercises kind of emphasized. I want to go through a couple of things now that need sort of different emphasizing that I think in the book, this book is by e economists and we're here to kind of as technologists and social scientists trying to get graphs to work for us. So when here we talk about components and giant components, again, you're the one as the researcher that's defining what's relevant. It's really pointless to think about a network graph of everything or every one in the world because you would never be able to analyze that graph. So focusing on a component is very normal. So you're going to break the graph up, you're going to do a subset of nodes and focus on that set of nodes. So it's possible also, once we're focusing on a set of nodes, that we can actually say we have various components in what would be considered a, quote, world graph, maybe. And in that case, it's possible to graph the components separately, meaning we zoom up a level. Okay, We aren't re necessarily going to do that much. I mean, at this point, it's we've got a lot going on. But that's kind of one of the options here, to reduce the complexity of what's going on. The next thing that's super, super important is how they define an edge. Defining an edge is a huge deal in, I mean, what your graph is going to look like, you know, everything about it. Certainly how you define a node is something, but it's really enough to start saying node is a object slash agent. And at that point, you know, people is easy enough to make a node. So here we had a graph. This was a graph of the uh, what was this? This was co-authors, so people that appeared on the same paper together. And you look at the graph over here and you can see there's actually a sort of large central component in the middle, and then there's these three other sort of isolated nodes together. Now I want to emphasize here, the reason this is all drawn together is because whoever the researchers is, think of all these nodes as being connected in another way already, okay? Now, I think these are people who work at the National Institutes of Health and a few different research centers. What I want to emphasize here is this is people that have co-authored an article together. The sub underlying graph, the implied connections, might include people that ate lunch together, people that had coffee together, people that uh, met each other in the parking lot. I mean, there's a whole lot of ways that our nodes might be connected behind the scenes, which is actually why we're seeing this graph here with these two, or really three different components with two that are really tiny and one that's really big. So defining an edge is a huge deal. So switching over to their small world idea in the book, and boy, do they sure love that one. The idea of the six degrees of separation entirely depends on your definition of an edge. So if you think about the Bacon number, it's actually a pretty low number. I don't know if you remember that from the book. I think it was something like most of them are less than five. The Bacon number edge definition is cast members. So that means this is someone who appeared in a movie and maybe appears in the credits. They spoke something or in some way acted and got included in the credits. So just based on that, all the people of all these movies are very you know, closely connected. They have a very short distance to each other. The Milgram experiment was a similar thing. Well, not similar. I mean, they defined their edge. They defined it in a different way. And the idea there was someone you know on a first name basis. So what I want you to think about right now is if we're going to think about the network of uh, movies, you would change the bacon number if you just simply added 
the directors of movies, for example. So if it included cast member and director, it would might be a different number if you included cast members and producers and not directors. So there's a lot of variability in here on how you might come up with your quote, small world number, meaning your average distance. Similarly, the Milgram experiment, this idea of someone you know on a first name basis, and I know this as an American, what that means, uh, knowing someone on a first name basis, I actually know people that would you know, consider themselves very prominently that I can address on a first name basis, but I know in other countries, this is someone I would never address by their first name. You know, for example, I know one of the uh, city council members of our city here, and I address her by her first name, which is, you know, that's just what I do. And so we think about, you know, sort of my connection, my degrees of separation from, you know, just some random, not random, if I picked, say, Barack Obama, and how many steps would it take me to get to Barack Obama is probably via this woman who I'm, quote, on a first name basis. It's very short distance where, um, you know, if I wasn't, comfortable addressing her on a short name basis, all of a sudden, you know, the distance expands by probably 10. So defining an edge is a very, very important thing. And you as a researcher are the one who is going to define the edge and it's based on what's useful to you. So I like to think of this as flows. Some people don't like the idea of flows, but to me, we're activating an edge. So usually information is going to flow. So we talked about nodes being agents, so having something they want to do, and that means the nodes are activating the edges um, sort of consciously. So if we went back to some of the examples in the book, one of them is about instant messaging, who talked to whom. With that sort of model, we're going to say, you know, knowing who talked to whom, what we're trying to do is say, what's going to happen later? What happens next? Who is going to talk to whom? And so we might be trying to predict, you know, when a, vid when a video goes viral, where does it go? Who is going to engage those edges? It's the same with these. Um, we'll get to these as we go later in the book. That's, you know, as you make transactions, who's trading with whom? This is the idea of, you know, who traded in the past with whom can be modeled. Who is going to transact with whom? This also, and I want you to think about this one too, if you think about web pages, we have web pages that have links to other pages. You can use those to predict what links a user will follow, but we understand that just because a link appears on the page, it doesn't mean that they're actually ever going to be used. And I think that's the most profound example here about an edge. So an edge here, a link here, is a, an availability or a likelihood of a future connection. Okay, so our edges, when we as researchers model these edges, what we're trying to say is so this is something that might happen, that might be used, and we need to be conscious of that, that there's sort of a statistical probability that going on here. So hopefully that'll get you um, kind of the uh, interesting things going on here. Um, we'll do the exercise, and hopefully that'll um, illuminate things further.